Okay, so how many people here are new to bird and bird ownership? Being you've had your bird under two years. So everybody's had birds for their lifers. We have lifer bird keepers. This is good. Okay, how many people have a conure or smaller as a pet? And how many people have bigger than a conure as a pet? There we go. Okay. I do that so that I understand the context of the how and what we're going to talk about for the short time that we have. Okay. I hate cords. <laughs> okay, so first thing we're going to start with is some of the basics. Um, everybody here probably lives in the GTA. Everybody here uses municipal water. Municipal water is not your friend when you have pets. It doesn't matter if it's dogs, cats, birds, reptiles. It has chloride and chlorine in the water. It acts as a bleach to make it safe for you to drink. It is horrid for small animals and pets because the water is designed to be for a biomass of an adult human, not for a pet. So what happens is all the nutrition that you're buying for your pet and all the food that you're going through and all the stuff you're chopping up and preparing you're pouring bleach over it essentially and you're destroying a lot of it and it's just filler. It's going in the top and out the bottom and uh, you're wasting your time. So what we need to do is we're looking at bottled water or filtered water. Um, yes, through the fridge is okay. Um, we don't want distilled. Distilled goes too far the other way and you're actually removing all the minerals and trace elements from the water. If you go that far, you have to add a supplement. The second one, uh, there's two or three things in the industry that kind of get me crazy. First one is water. Second one, how many people here feed seed to the birds? We have a few people that do seed. So when you purchase your seed, making sure that it did not come from the bulk barn, it did not come from a big box store, that it was bought and purchased in a bag that was nitrogen flushed to keep it fresh, once you open it, you expose your seed to oxygen. What happens at that point is 20% moisture in the seed, oxygen closed back up in a bag, you can get a fungus on the seed that makes the birds sick. In the summer with the Ontario humidity, we have a lot of problems with fungal on seed and small birds and a lot of people, ooh, I lost my canary, ooh, I lost my finch, ooh, I lost my budgie, my cockatiel. They get the runs, they get the, and I don't know what happened. It was improper seed storage. 70 to 75% of vet visits is Im improper nutrition. Probably of that, 60% of it is just improper seed storage. So once you've opened your bag of seed, you've fed your bird, you make sure that you put it in a container that's left open. Surface area that's rectangular, lots of space for air movement. Do not seal the seed. Do not keep it in the fridge. Do not freeze your seed. Cool dry up off a concrete floor and left open. It's a huge one. It's a classic mistake that a lot of bird keepers make. The other one is <clears throat> we, everybody wants to cover their birds at night. Everybody feels that they need to be covered and they put a drape over top. I don't like that. The reason we used to do it is when we lived in homes in the 70s and 80s when birds started to become prevalent as pets in homes, we would have to cover them because the wind would hit this side of your apartment or your house and on this side the drapes would go whoosh, whoosh, right? Because we lived in drafty homes and birds can't deal with drafts. So we would cover them. That was for the bird's safety. Nowadays, with the way that we build houses and we work on things, we don't need to do that. What happens is when you cover the bird, they can pull that in and we have more cases of them getting it wrapped around their legs, around their necks and worse. And you end up having all kinds of problems with your bird. So don't cover them. The other thing that I'm finding as of late, people when they get their pet bird, they always want them in the living room, right beside the TV. They're right in the main living space because they want maximum amount of time with their pet. The thing that they forget is, it would be the same as if I came to your house, took your bed, wheeled it out into the living room, right beside the TV, and said, there, have yourself a restful night's sleep. It isn't going to happen. Make sure that your bird, most birds come from equatorial regions, meaning they get 12 hours of light, 12 hours of dark. They get proper rest. Make sure your bird is getting that because you get a grumpy three-year-old. It's like a three-year-old that didn't get his nap. You get a bird that acts out, they scream, they bite, they carry on, and it's just improper sleep. They didn't get a good restful night's sleep. So making sure that you look after some of that as well. Um, the other thing is not putting birds in front of windows. 
you can't control the outside environment around a window where your birdcage is, and you end up having problems with outdoor predators. It can be cats, it can be hawks, it can be the mailman, it can be all kinds of silly things that cause your bird stress. The other one is, as the seasons change and your birdcage is in the window, and you hit, you can cook your bird, which has happened as well. People don't realize with the season change that they have a problem. The other one is, is your bird's on an outside wall. That cold from the outside can also be a problem. So making sure um, fish bowls are another one that I like to move to inside walls in the winter. Just think about the context of all of that. Is there any questions? Nope, I must be doing a good job. Okay, so we're gonna move along. How many people here feed pellets to the birds? Very good. Is there any brands in particular that are better than others is the question. So, <clears throat> all pellets are not created equal. All birds have different nutritional values or values that they need. So making sure that you understand the creature that you're dealing with so that you make sure you have the, same, the right nutritional value. So I brought some things here to show. So the question that I get asked all the time about coloring research and making sure some pellets, this one is a natural, some of them have a coloring agent in them. You have to do your research and make sure that the pellet that you're buying, if it has a color in it, is safe to use. Just because they put it in a bag, just because they're selling it to you, did not mean that somebody approved it and it was actually a nutritious diet for your pet. Make sure you ask questions and figure out. Case in point, African greys need more calcium in their diet than other birds. Amazons and macaws need more vitamin A in their diet than other birds. Budgies need more iodine in their diet than other birds. So a, a budgie diet doesn't work for a gray. A gray diet doesn't work for an Amazon. Just because you have one bird and you've learned that, make sure you're doing your research. So the question too is, some people don't like the color in the pellets because it's an added thing, it's an extra thing to process. I understand that. The other thing that I have a pet peeve about is people will buy pellets for the appropriate size of birds. So bird manufacturers of pellets will do lar like a large, a medium, a small, an extra small. I feed a medium to everybody. One size pellet, if you have multiple birds in the home, it's keeping it fresh, it goes through, it goes faster, and you don't have near the, um, the stale data and the problem. The other issue is you're not running for one bag for this bird, one bag for that bird, one bag, you just have one big bag, saves you money in the end, buy bird toys. Stimulate your pet with the toys, the money you would save by buying the, extra, the different sizes. The other problem that you have is, and it's new, it isn't for dog and cat people, they got rid of soy and dog and cat food a long, long time ago, about eight years ago in the industry. In bird, for some reason, we still do soy. Does anybody know why soy is bad? Soy has 40% estrogen naturally in soy. So when you consume soy as a woman, you're putting extra 40% estrogen. As a man in your diet, 40% men do not need estrogen. <laughs> in what I'm finding in pet birds is, the 40, extra 40% in the soy in pet birds that are girls, egg laying in pets, and in males, frustrated birds pulling out their feathers, screaming and acting out, and then we have behavior modification issues where when we switch to, this happens to be a brand without soy, in six weeks off of soy, we have a new bird that isn't all stressed out, isn't acting all crazy, and we don't have near the egg laying issues. So again, just educating yourself. The other thing that we do in dogs is we have a puppy food, we have a, a, a regular adult food, and then we have a senior food. Well, in birds, they're the same way. Their nutritional values change as they change their different life cycles and if a bird's molting. Molting is when birds lose feathers and they need extra protein because the feathers are protein. So one of the products that's good for, and it doesn't matter if it's a small bird or a large bird, egg food is used as an extra protein additive to be able to, to give the bird the, the nutritional value that it needs to be able to form the feathers. Now, some of the behavior stuff about birds that we're going to get into. How many people here have pet birds that they actually take out? They handle. So we have a few in the crowd. <clears throat> 
So here are some of the basic rules of birds that I have learned over 40 years of keeping birds. When you have a bird, you always keep it below your eye level. Your control zone is here on your arm. Always holding your bird down below your eye level. If the bird gets above your eye level, get a stool, get something, and get the bird down so you're higher than them. The highest bird in the flock runs the flock. If you see a group of sparrows outside, it's the top two birds fly off, the rest will follow. In the house, you are the top bird. You are to keep the bird in control. The other thing I employ with birds, they like a firmer hand when you're dealing with them. So I do the three strikes, you're out. Same as kids. How many people here have kids and do the three strikes? One, two, <laughs> never get to three. With birds, it's a step up. I said step up, it's a firmer and a tone change. And then the third time, I just follow through. Oh, you hit the floor. Here, let me step up. And if you stay and you do that and you follow through each time, you're fine. The people run into problems. Says, could you, could you, could you step up? Step, and you watch people doing that and they have problems. You have to follow through. The bird understands what's going on and it wants that regularity. It likes that uniformity of how I step up. It's important to be done that way. <clears throat> so, no birds on shoulders because you have no control. Bird is now here. How many people have seen, you know, you're doing, the, can, I can't get the bird. Can you get the bird? Can you get my bird? It doesn't work really well. You have no control. Bird's down here. In six months of stepping up, behaving, listening, you can pick up your bird and give them your shoulder, but you never let them take your shoulder. There's a difference, you're in control. If they don't behave, down they come. So how do you discipline a bird? So I'm gonna pick on this gentleman here. So if I'm wanting to discipline you, and I start doing this to you, what are you gonna do to me? You're gonna bite my finger, you're gonna be pissed because I'm aggravating you. Same with a bird, you never flick a beak, you never hit a bird, this isn't gonna get you anywhere. You know what they hate? Stepping up. Step up, step up, step up, step up. Doing laddering, we call it laddering. That's how you discipline. The other classic mistake people make is you discipline a bird and I'm done with you. And you slap them back in the cage. That cage is their home. It's not a discipline. So if you discipline your bird and you put it straight back in the cage, they're gonna hate you. That's my home, that's not a discipline. So then I get bit every time I go to put my bird back in the cage because it's a discipline, it's not a home. So if you discipline the bird, set them down, then you can pick them up and put them back in their cage. Don't directly use it as a discipline. It's a home. Any questions? Yes. How do you get your birds to go back in the cage when they want to be out of the cage? How do you get your birds back in the cage when you, they don't want to go back? <clears throat> so you can use treats. The other thing is, when you employ the step ups and you're in control, they will do what you ask them to do. Usually they will follow through, but uh, usually a treat in the cage or, or it can be like a Nutriberry, it can be a dried piece of fruit, it can be some reason to go back to the cage. What's that? Step up, step up, step up, set them down, and then usually if you put them in backwards, they'll go back into the cage as well. But usually they need some sort of a stimulation to want to go back to the cage. But they usually need to be out for a while too. Like that you can't be, get them out for two minutes and then slap them back in. They need some time to get out and spread their wings and, and uh, be able to work. How do you know if they're paying attention to you when they're out? Eye contact. They tell you, they have body gestures. Same thing, potty training. Another one I get asked a lot, how do you potty train your bird? You gonna, anybody who has a pet bird, you get a rapport with that bird and you will actually notice there's a body language that usually starts with this and then down and they're pushing her down, pushing her down. All of a sudden you'll see the tail go and out we go, right? At that point, use a word, bombs away, sunshine, whatever you want. Every time they go through that motion, before long, you can say the word, they'll do the motion. If you have a good bond with your pet bird, they don't want to poop on you because it makes you upset. 
So a lot of birds, well, why'd you bite me? Why is he doing that? He wants off of you to do his business, to come back onto you because he knows it upsets you and doesn't want to poop on you. Yes? Side pooper. <clears throat> so the question is, how do you deal with a side pooper? Side pooper is, we have our cage, we sit in the side and we crap out of our cage. <clears throat> you can't fix the problem. You know why? It's a green winged macaw, it's a smart bird. If you think about it in context, if it was your house and you were pooping in your house, do you want it in your house or do you want it in the neighbor's house? So you get it out of your cage. I don't have to deal with it anymore. And the maid comes and cleans it up. It's the perfect world. And that's what happens. It's hard to get birds. The other thing you, do, <laughs> the other thing you can do is put up perches higher. Sometimes if they have a higher perch in the cage, they feel more secure and they stay in. It's just a side pooper. Yeah, you can't fix side poopers. They're a pain. Yes. Is it male or female? Question is, it's an Asian, Asian parrot, which would be a ringneck, an Alexandrian, a Derbian, a plumhead. It's a female bird, and why is it aggressive to the family? The, first, the, other question, or the other thing I didn't go over, which we'll get right back to your question, wing clipping or not to wing clip. I'm a pro keep wings clipped. You have control over your bird. A bird in your home is your responsibility. You bought the bird for the nutrition, the housing, the exercising, the mental stability, everything is your responsibility. You took that responsibility on. Birds live 60, 80, sometimes more years. You took on that responsibility when you educated yourself. It is now your responsibility to also keep that safe, nutritionally sound and safe. Full wing birds can fly into windows, fly outdoors, Anybody who wants to look online, I lost my bird. Has anybody seen my blue and gold macaw fly past your window? Please bring it in. That doesn't make any sense to me. It, I understand. Birds are to fly. It's natural for them to fly. It's not natural to have them as a pet in your house. Then it's your due diligence to make sure that they are kept safe. When birds are breeding, when they go through their hormones, when they go through their puberty, when they go through those life stages, they, get, they don't think with their head. Sometimes they bite and they're more aggressive when they have wings. You have no control over something that can fly away from you and you can't do your step ups. So the same equation is if you had your, your dachshund and you're walking down the 401 without a leash, how well is that gonna go for the dog? You have no control over the dog. You can't control where it's going. You can't, dis same thing with the bird. If it's got full wings, how are you going to run that bird? You can't keep it in control. You can't keep it safe. You can't take it outside for, for natural interaction with the sun. You can't do anything safely without a harness or without a cage. It makes it hard. So coming back to the question, knowing different species, different species breed at different times because of where they are located in the world. Domestification of a species in parrots, it takes three generations to be domesticated in macaws we'll pick on, sexual maturity from a baby to mature is about eight years. Seven, eight years depending on gender, that they're any good at what they're doing. So that's 21 years. Birds have only been really kept as pets, we'll say the 90s. So domestication of a species is, is taking a while in some species, and that's if they breed right when they're supposed to and we get the next baby and they mature. So it, a lot of species aren't domesticated yet. A budgie would be, cockatiels would be, lovebirds would be, because they're quick. They, they, they're sexually mature in six to eight months. The problem is, is that we have species that aren't domesticated, so Asian, Asianatic parents, parrots are not domesticated yet so that they're, we don't get to, as breeders, select like they do with dogs, that we get ones that are better or worse. These ones bite, this line is, is genetically weak, and we're still working through a lot of that. The difference in some species as well is the gender. So in Asian, Asian birds, the females wear the pants in the relationship. A female eclectus, a female ringneck, a female alexandrian, absolutely calls the shots where we're going to breed, when we're going to eat, what we're going to do, and when it's going to happen. And that's the way it is, period, with Asiatic parrots. So as a pet, females are way harder to run than a male. So in an Asiatic parrot, everybody wants a male as a pet. 
They're easier to work with, they tend to talk better, and they're easy to get along in the house. So back to your question, make sure the wings are clipped and you have to socialize keeping the bird off shoulders, do it lower and, and just keep working. But get the bird really low when you're trying to work with your other people. How old is the bird? 10 years old, you're gonna have a hard time. It's not easy. That wouldn't be a, a, a family pet. That would be an individual's pet if I was selling the bird. And if it was a young bird, it would have to be socialized properly in the first year of life to run it through to get it so it had it, it knew its manners and its place in the home. Yes? A rehome older bird? <clears throat> Okay, so rehome, the question is about rehoming an older bird that somebody else has had as a pet. I equate the same thing as dating. How many people here are dating? Not married. Okay, everybody's married and we're in a perfect world. Wonderful. Um, when you go dating, your, 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 your person that you're dating had a life before you. They come with all the good, the bad, and the evil in their tickle trunk. And then you open that up. It's the same as a pet bird. They can be, have been trained well, they will work well, they have good nutrition, they have all the bones of a great pet, just circumstance made them be rehomed. Most of the time, it's that the pet owner didn't do their diligence, didn't train them properly, there's nutrition problems, there's an issue, and they're rehoming. The problem is a pet owner, and somebody without the expertise to be able to say, this is the problem, this is what needs to be worked on, it's tricky rehoming a new bird. The other problem is, case in point, um, disease and disease management in pet birds. We've come a long way, there's DNA tests, but you need to be careful because some people take the bird to the vet, find out that it has a problem. Because parrots are expensive, I'm not eating the bill on this, I'm not going down with this bird, and they rehome it when the bird had a problem that can't be fixed. And then when the next owner, oh, my bird just died, I don't know why. Well, it had a problem before you even bought it. They didn't disclose it to you when you purchased it. Um, African greys are case in point. They're really bad for beak and feather disease. There's no cure for it. There's a DNA test for it. You can know whether or not the bird has it, but if you don't test for it, you don't know. So you need to be careful about the purchases that you make. Um, make sure you have a good vet. If there's a club or an organization that does socialization with parrots, um, BFBS, which is in uh, Richmond Hill, they have a show once a year and they have meetings once a month. It's a good resource for you to be able to go to places like that and to be able to ask questions of people who are in the industry and understand. Um, Jane here breeds birds as well. She's a resource that you could use online. But again, Google is a wonderful place. Google has not given me that internet eraser that I have asked for for years. There is a ton of things online that are not factual, that are wrong. Yes. Sorry, it's... People bring birds to uh, bird shows, and yes. they bring birds to meetings, and they're in contact with other birds. How do you avoid getting a disease from that? Okay, so the question is, when you have other birds coming out to meetings, going to social events, and you're worried about a disease management, much like if you had a dog or a cat and you had a puppy. With dogs and cats, they always tell you six to eight months, make sure that the puppy has a good immune system before it goes out. Birds are the same. I don't like a lot of interaction with a young bird going out and dealing with a lot of other birds until their immune system develops. A lot of the bird diseases that are out there, most are direct contact. Some are airborne. So as long as you're doing disinfecting and try to make sure that you're hang in groups of places where you know what's going on. Like most club meetings, people love their pets enough that they actually went to the vet and checked out. People who take their new, cute, wonderful bird, conure, budgie, cockatiel, and head off to every pet store to show their bird, you're flirting with trouble because you don't know where those pet stores have had all their birds and where they came from. You could be getting yourself into a lot of problems with your pet. It's a smart, just educate yourself, think before you do. A lot of bird ownership and bird questions that I get are common sense. It's that people see it's a bird, so I have to reinvent the wheel. Actually, most of the information and the proper information is already inside you. You just have to think about the process. Just remove the bird portion, and the rest will come clear. Yes? 
The question is, is it important to get your birds sexed? It depends on the species. If you were getting an Amazon, absolutely. The males are more aggressive than the females. The reason that I like to get birds sexed, and one of the main reasons is, do you have a girl or do you have a boy? Because I don't know why, but Mother Nature loves birds to lay eggs around 9.30 to midnight. When the vet clinic is closed and there's no support and you're online screaming your head off going, what the hell's wrong with my bird? It's in the bottom of the cage. It's all poofed up. She's grumpy at me. It's grumpy at me. It could be egg bound or laying an egg. Just want some space. Give me some privacy. Give me a couple hours. We'll just move this right along and I'll give you an egg. But you don't know what's happening. So if you had sexed the bird ahead of time, then you would know if you have a boy or you have a girl. Oh, we're on the cage. We're puffed up. We've been ripping up, tearing up paper for the last three days. We've been kind of out of sorts, not the word I would usually use, we're laying an egg. And then you would have to support that with egg food or calcium to making sure that we have enough of the calcium in the system because female birds need calcium support. If they're laying too many eggs, they actually deplete and take the calcium from their skeleton. Eggs will actually get stuck and what's what we call egg binding and female birds can actually die of egg binding. So all good reasons to know what gender we have. Any other questions? Yes. <clears throat> so the question is, birds' intelligence and intellect compared to other animals. Um, a few scenarios that I can give you and then answer your question is, in every house, I do not know one, there, well, there's exceptions. If you're running your bird properly, it's the humans, then the birds, then the dogs, then the cats, then the rest of the animals in the house. Doesn't matter. In a, in a house that's not running properly, you will see the birds running the house, the people only pay the bills and they run every time the bird needs something. That's the wrong way to have that hierarchy. I have multiple customers who have, we'll just pick on African greys. The grey sits out in the stand, it has its pellets sitting in the dish, and the dog's name was Mac. Here Mac, here boy. Dog would sit, roll over, beg, shake a paw, do the whole thing, and he would throw a pellet down as the treat for the dog as the reward. He'd wait, and he'd do the whole routine again. And this would go on for hours. He was a sheepdog. He loved being told what to do, and the bird loved telling him how to do it and when to do it, and the dog listened absolutely to this bird, to the point where the bird would call the humans watching the dog to let the dog out to go pee because the dog had told the bird that he had to go pee and the bird would tell the people to let him out. <laughs> so birds are, when they actually do the studies, birds are actually smarter than monkeys, than primates. They can problem solve and they can do more. Um, it's absolutely amazing how a bird can take apart a whole bird cage with the whole nuts and everything and remove everything, can let themselves out, trash a room, and put themselves back in the cage and lock it. So it, it's, it's just a matter, they have all the time in the world to sit there and figure it out and problem solve. To where cockatoos, you can't keep them with a combination lock to lock the cage because they sit and put their ear beside it and their foot manipulates it until they hear the clicks and they figure, back, they figure out the back and forth, the three to do the combination lock. Only takes them about less than a week to figure out a combination lock. So you have to use a lock with a key well, then you can't leave the key in because they figure that out. You have to put the key up on the wall. But Lord help you, if they're out of the cage, they go over and take the key and lose it on you. So, yes, it, it's just step after step. Um, parrots as pets will manipulate people in the house usually about three steps. If I do this, your reaction is this. And then I do that, and then your reaction as a human is this. And that's what I wanted. Look what I did. I just moved you three steps down the road to get what I wanted. And they manipulate you to do that. And you won't even realize they're doing it because it could take half a day for them to get through all their steps to get what they actually wanted. <clears throat> it's amazing to watch interactions with people and how, they, uh, how their birds want to manipulate them. Now, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, and they're going to kick me off the stage soon probably, when you have multiple birds in the home, make sure that you understand the needs of the different species and the interactions of keeping those together in the same environment. If you own a macaw, an Amazon, um, Asiatics, 
they have, and where they live, they don't have to deal with a lot of dander, a lot of problems, they don't have issues. If you own budgies, cockatiels, greys, cockatoos, and they're in proximity to Amazon's macaws, pionis, Asiatics, it's like them having to live with a smoker. Half a pack of cigarettes plus a day is what it's doing to their lungs living with those other birds in proximity. Make sure that you manage that. The other thing that bird people love to do is if this is the wall of the home, the front of the stage, bird one, bird two, bird three, bird four, bird five. It keeps the mess in one spot and I'm good and the home is organized. As breeders, we would put the male bird, the female bird, this bird beside that bird, so that we pair bond them together, sitting side by side. You have pet birds. Now you're stressing the crap out of them because you got a boy beside a girl beside a, and they don't get to be individuals. Pet birds think they're a sun, you're just the planets going around their orbit, and here you go, giving me competition. Set them individual, put barriers between them so that they can be their own individuals, okay? Make sure that you set them up, that they can be their own little sons in their own little environment and that everything revolves around them. That's what they want and that's what they think. Making sure, because pets don't have pets. It's the other classic question. I have a cockatiel and I work and I get a second cockatiel because it keeps that one company. Your first pet doesn't need a second pet. Do you as an individual want a second bird in the house as a separate setup? They're not keeping each other company. You're their company. So it's a classic mistake. Same thing as a car. How many people here have two of the same model of car in the driveway? We don't do that. You buy an SUV, you buy a sports car, you have a runaround car. Birds are the same. You want a cockatiel, get yourself a conure, do a Quaker, do an Asiatic, but you don't line up four Quakers as pets. Pets don't have pets. Do different species if you want multiple birds. Don't get the same one twice thinking that you're helping the other one. All you're doing is pissing it off because it, see it, it sees it as direct competition. Even if you have two boys, if you have two girls, they still can bond together. They cut you out and or competition for your affection. So it's that hierarchy flock in the house again that you have issues with. Lots to think about, lots to do. Um, any other questions? So it's a cockatoo bobbing back and forth and stepping up, up and down. Did you pay attention to the bird? The bird got your attention. The bird does it because if I do this and act kind of wild, what happens? You're paying attention to me. Wow, I'm the sun and you're just the planet revolving around me. That's what birds do. They do that to get your attention. And cockatoos are one of the most manipulative birds out there for getting attention. They don't even care if it's screaming, and they, you're, you're mad at them and you're cussing at them and you're, it's negative attention. It's attention. I'm getting attention. That's all they care about. It can be positive or negative, but cockatoos do everything to make it about them. That's the, the type of species that they are. So the question is, when you're moving things around in the house, why does the bird lose its mind every time you move anything? Birds like uh, Asiatics and other types of birds, I call it Marco Polo. So if you watch birds, uh, conures or Quakers, if you breed them or you have multiples, one will squawk, they squawk across here, back and forth and back and forth. You're moving furniture, are you okay? So the bird's asking, are you okay? Oh, you moved from furniture, are you okay? Are you over there? I'm over here, are you over there? Oh, you moved from furniture, is that all? Same thing, um, vacuum cleaners. If you have a built-in vacuum cleaner, that's a huge snake in the house. Are you okay? That snake almost got us. Did you see that? Oh my God. And off we go on a tangent because there's this big snake in the house eating everybody. They hate those built-in vacuum cleaners, the ones that, with the big long cords is a huge thing for them. Uh, extension cords. You want to freak out birds? Put an extension cord through the room and lay it on the floor. Right? And it's not doing anything to them. But again, back to they're not domesticated. So in their mind, right? Same thing. You want cockatiels. At night, cockatiels have really bad night vision. Really bad. But in Australia, there is a ton of snakes, a ton of reptiles, and a ton of bird of prey that eat cockatiels naturally. 
So a pair of cockatiels in the wild would have three clutches a year of four to five babies. So we're talking 15 babies a year. At the end of that year, you're lucky if one or two of those babies are still alive because of predation being somebody else's food. So a cockatiel in your home, people will stick them in the kitchen, stick them in the living room. You get up from bed, you go to walk across to get yourself a sandwich, something out of the fridge at 1.30 in the morning, bah! and off goes your cockatiel, it's called night fright. And the way they deal with night fright in the wild, fly. Fly like you never flew before and just keep flying because the danger can't catch up to you. And there's whole studies of budgies and cockatiels who go get scared at, at dusk and they fly until morning. They don't stop. They just keep flying to get away from the danger. Well, in their home, what they do is they bash against the cage. They break blood feathers, which is new feathers. They can bust wings. They can bust necks. They can bust their heads open. And you can turn the light on. You can tell them. You can read them peace and war, the whole manual. They won't even hear you while they're in their static state. It's everything you've got to settle them down. So it's really important for a nightlight for cockatiels so they can see at night. But that's just management of one species that I'm talking about. It's all those little things that you have to know as a pet owner that is important for birds. Is there any other questions? Okay. If anybody has any questions, there's two booths on the other side here. One is the BFBS, which is a... Um, they have a show in the fall if anybody wants to get information. They'll have pamphlets over there. They're a group that meets in Richmond Hill. They have a monthly meeting. And then the other one is EPO, Ethical Parrot Owners. And they have a monthly meeting the third Wednesday of every month. And it's pet related. So they encourage people to bring out their pet questions and hang around with a bunch of crazy bird-minded people like themselves. And, and it gives them a sense of community that they're not insane having four and five and six parrots in their home as pets. Thank you.